to relax because you didn't have to read anything, but it still doesn't mean you can't be pimps, especially you guys, because you know this, so you guys can be pimps. So today we're going to talk about the IOLs from Alpha to Omega, and which alphabet does that come from? From the Greek, of course. All right. So we're going to go back to Barcelona, since I think I'm going to run out of Barcelona pictures before I run out of lectures this year. I may make you look at puppy pictures, but I don't know. We'll have to decide that. So you're a captive audience, so we'll have to decide. So this is back to the cathedral again that they're redoing in Barcelona, the old cathedral. And it is, it's pretty amazing. They've, they've kind of redone the, um, the inside. And I mean, it's, it's the ultimate high Renaissance cathedral. And so just e incredibly elaborate icons and, and statues and just very vibrant. Very exciting, so. They could just sell that off and be out of debt. Yeah, seriously, this would like bring Spain's unemployment uh, below 20%. They would just use this on a public work project. But I mean, it's just the, the detail on some of these are fantastic. You get in there and you look at it and you go, wow. And I mean, through the years, the colors have faded and, and they're working to try to kind of restore some of the colors, but it's a difficult task. But you could imagine these in their, in their glory. You see the robes on the king there, are, you know, were red. And so it's, it's really pretty amazing when you look at them. And it's that way through the entire one. There's, you know, it's a typical uh, Catholic cathedral and there's little, you know, alcoves all the way around the whole thing that each one of them is as elaborate as the one before. And so I just picked a few of them and took pictures and they're just, they're just fantastic. The problem is, is this is just an old dark um, one and they're trying to, as I said, to revise it, but it's still kind of dark and, you know, grungy inside. They're, they're doing their best, although this probably all shut down five years ago, so. And then this is a miniature um, gold. Kind of, we weren't supposed to take pictures of this, so I felt like, you know, James Bond, and I had my camera on in my hand and kind of went next to it. And, you know, there's, this, there's these guards in there going like, so if you turn on your camera here, that do do, you know, or your, you know, your phone, they're like, they're all over because there's no pictures allowed. But um, so I clandestinely, you know. Some pictures. Did so your flash go off? <laughs> now it was a, it's actually the reason why they're all kind of dark. There's no flash on any of these, so that's why they're dark, but but very pretty. And oh, I forgot to erase that one. That's the beef eater in London last year. All right, so we can't start with talking about IOLs without talking about Mr. Ridley. And so Mr. Ridley was in um, London at St. Thomas's Hospital. He was working on IOLs. This is the plaque at St. Thomas's. So Alan and I found this when we went to London in 2006. And, and it was very funny because we went to St. Thomas's and we asked them at, at the desk, we said, where is the Ridley plaque? And they went, they went who? <laughs> so, I mean, they didn't know. So we kind of wandered the halls of St. Thomas's and eventually found it. This was in a... Um, kind of a back hallway. And, and you know, St. Thomas is a big hospital. It's literally on, right across the river from Parliament. I mean, it's right next to the big Ferris wheel, the big eye, and so it's, it's right downtown there. And so we did find the plaque with where Mr. Ridley had, um, had done the first IOL. And so this is Mr. Ridley and his little fishing, his fishing hooks. He retired to a, a small uh, village in the countryside in England. But basically, when you go back in history, Mr. Ridley was a, a a surgeon in the in the British Army during World War II, and it's interesting in that he was initially in the Pacific Theater and has contributions to the field of of like tropical medicine, you know how they, they affect the eyes and all. So he wasn't just eye wells, but then he ended up in London during the Blitz, and what was happening is these British uh, fighter pilots were going up trying to shoot down the Nazi bombers and they would get um, you know, machine gun fire in their cockpits and the cockpit would shatter and then some of the cockpit material would go into the pilot's eyes. Well, this material was actually made of plexiglass, which is PMMA. And so very fortuitous thing. And so Mr. Ridley found that it didn't cause any inflammation. It was very inert inside the eye. And you know, at this time, people were doing um, either crude extra caps or intracapsular surgery and then patients were getting a fake expectables. And so, what happened was is that a rumor has it, I don't know, I've never talked to Mr. Ridley to see if this was true, because he's passed away since, but that a student said, well, you're taking out the lens, why don't you put in another one? And so that just may be legend. But in any event, he started figuring out that, you know, aphakia is not a great way of, of 
treating people. And Randy Olson will tell you the story. When he was first training, they were still doing intracaps without IOLs, and he was very proud of himself. He did the surgery at UCLA, and you know the patient ended up 2015, you know, with like a plus 10. Um, spectacle and, and he was patting himself on the back and the patient basically said C can you put my cataract back <laughs> and so if fake spectacles if you can imagine you get a 25 percent magnification you get this huge prismatic effect in the periphery so you get a large ring scotoma so these poor patients would have what they call the jack-in-the-box effect where you know you'd be attempting to drive and you'd look and there'd be nobody there and then you'd go to turn and suddenly a car would appear you know, out of nowhere, out of like a jack-in-the-box bouncing out. And so, and without your spectacles, you're functionally blind. I mean, you can't see anything. So, you know, he really worked with a company called Rayner, which is still, you know, one of the big IOL manufacturers in, in England. And, and Rayner put together a, an implant for him, and he thought he was doing these crude extra, cra extra caps. And he said, you know, since the we're taking out the cataract from inside the capsular bag, why don't we put an implant right back where it went? So he had a great idea. The problem is this is 1950, mind you. And so Rayner designed him a lens. The first one turned out to be way off. They didn't have the optics worked out, but they worked out the optics by the second one. And this is, a, this is patients where they would do, uh, they didn't have capsulotomies then. And so basically they would go in with a forcep, grab the capsule and tear it off. And then they would, I'll have to show you the video. I've got the, the you know, Ridley's original video. And, and then they would take a, um, like a muscle hook and just push it against the cornea and lock that lens nucleus out. You know, just push it out, you know, a big 13 millimeter wound. And then they would just irrigate a little bit and then they just cram that implant back in. And believe it or not, when these actually made it back inside the bag, they did okay. But when they were, you know, who knows, they'd be in the sulcus or partially in the bag, then they would cause some, some real problems. And so you can see, this is what it looks like on, on EM. And it was a disc lens to, to fill the capsular bag. So interesting idea. And this is an eye that was donated to the lab many years ago that had been, this is a Ridley lens that had been in the eye for about 40 years. And you can see it was actually within the capsular bag and was tolerated quite well over that period of time. Now, unfortunately with, with Mr. Ridley, he was doing this work in England. He had to do it in secret because you know the, same, the, the hierarchy said, this is radical idea. This is very crazy. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do this. And so Mr. Ridley came over to the American Academy of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology meeting in Chicago and proudly presented this data, at which time the president of the academy stood up and said, if anyone in the United States puts one of these dangerous devices in the eye, I will personally volunteer to testify at the malpractice trial for the patient. And so basically, no IOL research was done in the United States for 20 years. So, I mean, the hierarchy in the United States shut this down. They said, these are dangerous, these are terrible. And so, really, nothing was done in, in the U.S. at any time. So, this is one of the problems. This is the edge of the implant. You can see it's, you know, these were hand polished, you know. People were using a, a round makeup mirror, you know, and hand polishing these guys. So, you can imagine what that's going to do to the posterior surface of the iris if it's not within the capsular bag. So, People at that time were really not doing extra caps. In fact, right at about that time, people started to do uh, more and more intra caps, where you remove the entire lens and its capsular bag, and so there is no capsular support. So other surgeons in Europe said, hey, why don't we look at putting an implant in the anterior chamber? Because, you know, we've got the support there, and so we'll put an implant. And of course, they're all made of PMMA, all uh, non-foldable. And so one of Mr. Ridley's residents, Mr. Choice, Peter Choice, actually came up with some anterior chamber eyewalls. And this was his first one. It was, and and he, he ended up with nine different iterations. So this was the Mach 1, you know, because that sounds cool, like, you know, jet skull Mach 1. And so this was the Mach 1 idea. And then... He went through various different iterations. This was the, the Mach 8, and so this was the one that was most widely used. And so he went ahead and, and he worked with Rayner again to, to put these together. And in Europe, maybe in America, not, not least early on was there any research being done on these, but um, the problem with these lenses is they, they're PMMA, so they're non-foldable, they're one piece. They had to be fit perfectly. And the joke when I was a fellow 30 years ago was these came in two sizes too big and too small. So 
you would do a white to white measurement with a caliper. You can imagine how crude that is. And then you'd cram one of these guys in there. And so if they were too big, you'd get a cat's eye, oval pupil and chronic uveitis. If they were too small, they were propeller in the anterior chamber. And so it's very difficult to get these, to get these um, fit well. This was his last design, the Mach 9. And so just a little bit thinner. Now, one of the problems with lenses like this is they would scrape the iris, you'd get the bleeding in there, hyphema, you'd get chronic uveitis, you'd get glaucoma. And so the, the syndrome was called UG, uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome. We still talk about it now. And the problem is, is the UG syndrome was caused by ripoffs of Choices lenses, you know, copies that were made, not of his design, not of his design, and not with his quality control. And so, when we when we look at some of these, this is what they would look like. This is a cadaver eye with the cornea removed. And you can see the cat's eye pupil on this. Now, Mr. Choice, I was a Dave Apple Fellow, and so I was sitting on a panel at Ascaris with Mr. Choice on the panel and, and I gave a paper showing these terrible results and he got very ticked off because he made a point that these are not my lenses, these are unlicensed ripoff lenses. And so he was very upset about that. And of course I was a pre residency fellow, so I was like <laughs> but, So I made it clear we never said choice. We would say choice like or choice style or choice copies. And so this you can see what would happen when these lenses were too big. And so, um, let's see, where are we going to start here? Ah, Eileen, <laughs> what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at the angle, um, and it looks like the uh, peripheral iris is kind of thinned out and shoved into the ciliary body. Yeah, exactly. You can see that's been tucked, and so what happens is, is that foot plate of the PMMA lens has caught the peripheral iris and has pushed it right behind the ciliary body, so it's really tucked back there. So you can see it's thin, it's atrophied. You can imagine UG syndrome from this. You can, it would cause a oval cat's eye pupil, and so these were real problems. Now, these were being put in before viscoelastic, so people were putting in an air bubble in the anterior chamber and just cramming these in, so very difficult to put in. And this was one of those rip-offs. So this is the edge of that polished IOL. <laughs> now just for fun, I wish I still had the pictures here. When I was a fellow, we took a Coca-Cola bottle and broke it, and then em the edge. And the edge was, was like, didn't even look this bad. <laughs> so you can imagine what this PMMA with that type of a finish would do inside the eye. And so they really did cause a lot of problems with these. <clears throat> Well, as time went on, and eventually, you know, different companies started to get involved, finally, finally now, in the early 80s, people in the United States, you know, started to get permission to, to do these different IOLs and to um, come up with different designs. And so, this was the time when there was about 20 startup companies coming up, all popping up every day. And each doctor would sit down with one of the companies and come up with their designs and they'd name it after them. So this was Dr. Azar. And Dr. Azar was a, a real interesting guy from, I think he was from New Orleans or you know, mid, lower Midwest somewhere. But in any event, he's a bodybuilder. And so he has this you know, huge physique and would wear like skin tight sweaters when he gave talks to show off his muscles and he had a fake tan all the time. He's an interesting guy. I don't even know if he's still alive, but everybody would, would um, you know, name him after them. And so because the choice lens was solid, you know, the problem was is there's no give in that. So you have to fit it exactly. So what they started doing is saying, well, why don't we do a loop dial well? And so these were the closed loop IOLs. And you can see um, the optics still made out of PMMA, but now the haptics were made out of proline or polypropylene, which is kind of like a variation of almost like a Gore-Tex-like material, but polypropylene is very flexible material. And so these were closed loop lenses are very easy to put in. They wouldn't catch the iris, you know, as you went in. They wouldn't give you a cat's eye. Very, very easy to put in. And then immediately a whole bunch of copies started up. So Leisky came up with his lens, he just squared them off. And there was another one, a solid lens that was like this. There was even one, Hesburgh uh, in Michigan came up with this lens. And you can see now this has actually four closed loops 
with eight little things on there. So these are the ones, there was a surgeon in Salt Lake that was putting these in in the early 80s, and these are the worst lens I've ever seen to remove. And again, Randy and Alan, they'd all get referred up here when they would go bad. And so this would form little <coughs> cocoon-like synechia over eight individual loops. And so you'd have to go in there and cut them like eight different times when you're trying to take these out. These were just a nightmare to remove. But this was when all that, this was all exploding. This was all within about a year. All these different IOLs came out. And the problem is, is that with these closed loop IOLs, and this one effectively behaved like a closed loop lens, if the patient rubbed their eye, the whole optic would vault. And so if you imagine, if, if you've got like, like, you know, these closed haptics and you squeeze on them, they wouldn't, the haptic wouldn't take up the squeeze, the optic would vault. So it would either bounce forward and bang off the cornea, or those closed loops would dig into the iris. Now the problem is, is these things looked great for the first year or two. So these looked really good. And so when I was a fellow, there was a surgeon in town who founded the Eye Institute, who was advertising all over the TV. That was the first main advertising. He was putting in these miracle lenses, and he had zero complications. And he would give a lecture, I'm having no complications. This is the greatest thing. And as he's saying that, I have, you know, 12 corneas in jars on my desk with these IOLs in them, you know, that we had to remove. Well, of course, if someone has a complication, they don't go back to the original doctor, they go to somebody else. And so this kept the cornea surgeons at Moran busy, the Azar lens for at least a decade, you know, fixing corneas from those. And so this is one of the lenses, this was the Hesburgh lens. If you can see, that's actually well focused. And so the reason why you don't see well there, the cornea is edematous. So you've got corneal edema. The eye is red and inflamed, so you've got chronic UGG syndrome. And again, these are real buggers to remove. All right, so Costas, what is this we're looking at? Uh, it be like a house IOL. Believe it or not, this is one of those corneas that was on the jar in my lab. This was half of a corneal button. That's how thick they would get. So this is a totally edematous corneal button. And so you'd get corneal edema from these IOLs. And then the other thing is, this is the Lysky lens. Look at, this is a cadaver eye. We've removed the cornea. We're looking in as if we have a gonio mirror on here. Look at the synechial tunnel in the periphery. And so they would form these synechia around these round loops. And this would cause them to just fix it. And so you'd get glaucoma from this. But these are a bugger to remove. So when you would explant these, you would actually have to cut the haptics and just leave them in the angle, just cut them and, and then take them out. Because you would, if you went to pull that, you'd get an aerodialysis. So it would be, these are just, just terrible to remove. And this is what one of these loops looks like. This is again the, the Irish root, and here's that IOL loop. I mean, it would dig in almost to the ciliary body. In fact, the first IOL that was ever seen here when I was a student, IOL number one, we're up to, what are we up to now? Six, 7,000, IOL number one, was a looped antechamber IOL and it dug all the way through the root of the iris to the major iris circle and then blocked it off and the patient had ischemia and lost the eye. So that was IOL number one. So it's interesting. And so these could cause some real problems. This is one of those uh, other lenses with the eight loops on it. And you can imagine what it would be like. There's big peripheral iridectomies. These would rotate into the iridectomies and so these would just form a total synechial tunnel, so these were just awful to remove. These would have, you'd have to cut them in eight different places to remove these. So they were very tough. So there was a guy named Dubrov in uh, Washington, D.C., who said, well, if, if the closed loop lenses are difficult, you know, and they're causing vaulting and all, why don't we put an open loop on them? So what he did is he put three C-shaped loops on his IOL like propeller blades. Now, if you can imagine these broad C-shaped loops, you would actually get synechia that would close off about 270 degrees of the angle, and they'd get severe glaucoma. Second thing is this was a fly-by-night company that very much did not polish these well, didn't have good quality control, so they would, these patients would get chronic UNC syndrome. Um, again, there was a surgeon in town here who insisted on putting these in, even until the 
late 80s. And so he kept putting these in and we kept putting these out and, and the surgeon has since passed away, but as Dr. Crandall said, he was the leading cause of, of preventable blindness in Utah. <laughs> and he was still doing intracaps in the late 80s when people were starting even to fake let alone extracaps. So he'd do an intracap and he'd put these guys in. And so again, these kept our anterior segment surgeons busy for a decade. This was the Dubroff lens. And you can see what these would look like again. Chronic edema, red inflamed eye, lots of inflammation. And Nick, what are we looking at here? Um, corneum with some edema. Yeah, so you see a, what do we call this? A bolus. A bolus. So you see bolus keratopathy. So they would cause bolus keratopathy. <coughs> Ashley, what are we looking at here? Why the heck would I be showing you this picture? <laughs> This is a retina. Um. Oh boy, chances to pimp here. See, you guys thought you were free. <laughs> what part of the retina are we in? And how the heck can I tell that by looking at this picture? Um. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I got a Star Wars printer, I mean a Star Wars pointer for for Christmas and I forgot it, it's up in my briefcase. So if you look at the top layer, the ganglion cell layer, you see instead of being one cell layer thick, it's multiple cell layers thick. So we know we are in the macula. And then if you're looking, and we're gonna know these two lectures from now, you're gonna know these layers cold, you can see that there's some exudate in the outer plexiform layer of the macula in, in so-called Henley's layer. So this is cystoid macular edema. And so with chronic UG syndrome, chronic inflammation, you can get corneal edema, bolus you can also get chronic CME, cystoid macular edema. All right, so Charles Kelman, who was the inventor of the FACO machine, Kelman said, well, you know, if these closed-loop IOLs are causing these problems, why don't we get an open-loop IOL? And so this was his first attempt at it. We used to call this the pregnant seven. So if you look at it, it's like a seven that's pregnant, you know, so the pregnant seven. The problem with this is it's a stiff, again, PMMA, and so you would put these in, it was very awkward to put in. And so Kelman being a smart guy, you know, this was out on the market for like a day before Kelman figured out it's not gonna work. So he thinned out the haptics. Again, still a one-piece PMA, but he left the tripod design in there. Now, it was interesting because Kelman would go around to, to lectures and give lectures, and he said a tripod with three-point fixation is better than four-point fixation because if you have a bar stool on an uneven floor and it has three legs, it, it stays fine. If it has four legs, it wobbles. That was his argument. And so, again, this lasted for maybe a week. And then people realized that this still wasn't the best idea. So again, Kelman went right back to the drawing board and he came out with his multiflex. Now, does this look familiar? Yeah. It should, because now 32 years later, this is the anterior chamber IOL that we use to this day. And so very smart idea, it's an open loop. So think about open loop, like the leaf springs on a truck. You know, them big trucks, the guys from Wyoming drive, you know, the big leaf springs on them. So if you compress that, the haptics take the compression and the optic doesn't vault. So one of my fellow fellows actually did a study. We put it between two vices and measured the, how far it would vault when you do it. And the open loops wouldn't vault nearly as much as the closed loops. And so this would not vault. Now, instead of a round loop, these are almost flatter, so they're kind of rectangular in shape and flatter, so these would not dig into the angle. And the other smart thing Kelman did is if you look, it's not convex, it's concave. And so when you look, those round loops wouldn't close off in the angle, you would basically just have four points that would touch the angle. And so this is the lens we use to this day. And so very rapidly evolved, you know, this was, this was 1984 that these first came out. And so those have stood the test of time. Those are still the anterior chamber IOL we use now. If you're gonna pull one out, this is the one you use. This is the old apple core. And this is how we did work. Look, I don't know who that guy with the mustache is there in the corner, but we would lay out all of the pictures that we had taken, all these EMs, and then Dave Apple would dictate his chapter and we would all sit in there and put in stuff and we were holding that up that one that says IOL that was the, the 
precursor to the ocular surgery news because we were on the cover there. And so we, um, you know, we were holding that up there to say, ha ha, see, we're on there when we took this picture. So some of these other people, the woman in there is now a glaucoma person at Oshner in New Orleans. The, the guy with the white coat went into Las Vegas and had a very busy practice down there and sadly was riding a four-wheeler and flipped and broke his neck. And so he's now quadriplegic, which is very, very, very sad. And the other student, I don't know what happened to him. I, I lost track of him, sorry. But this is the so-called Apple Core. And so this was how we would do IOL work. All right, now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about iris-clipped IOLs. Because, again, when people were developing all these anterior chamber IOLs, there's big groups in Europe, mainly, saying, OK, if we're still doing intracaps here, why don't we come up with a, an implant that clips to the iris? And so this was one of the original uh, Binkhorst. So Cornelius Binkhorst was in the, uh, the Netherlands, and he came up with these. And interestingly enough, the Binkhorst lecture at ASCRS is the named lecture, now named after Binkhorst. So that's the big lecture every year at, at ASCRS. And so Binkhorst came up, and you can't see these. I'll show you a side view. Two of those loops come out planar with the optic, and then two of them go down and then back. So basically, you clip this to the pupil. So this was iris fixated lenses. Now, um, Jan Wurst, who just passed away recently, actually, um, said, well, you know, the problem with these lenses is if you dilate the pupil to look at their peripheral retina, the eye well falls out. So, minor detail, you know, it kind of dislocates into the vitreous or the anterior chamber. So, what Wurst said is, first of all, we can put sutures through there and suture to the iris. So those holes are where you would put a big suture through that are suture to the iris, but then people didn't like to do that, so again, he put a little clip on there. So he had this little tab that would clip it to the iris. And so we used to joke that this was indeed the worst lens, and, and that was the, the inside joke, because these behave very badly in the eye. But again, Jan Worst was, was a giant in, in IOLs, and they said he just passed away. And so he had to be in his 90s when he passed away. Now the problem is a lot of these haptics were made out of polypropylene, proline, which does degrade in the body when it's in touch with uveal tissue. So this was one of the first EMs that was ever done. Some, you know, again, swarmy Greek guy with a mustache wrote this paper out. And what we saw is the so-called mud flap cracking. And so when you had these proline loops in uveal vascularized tissue, they would degrade on the surface. Like when it rains and then it dries out and you get the mud flap, you know, mud flap cracking. This picture looks familiar because right now, if you take a proline suture, you can actually get degradation of proline, just like this, of the suture. So if you suturing an IOL to the sulcus or to the iris and you use a 10-0 proline, it will degrade like this. The reason I'm saying that is Walter Stark from Wilmer says that doesn't occur. It's all mechanical trauma scraping on these, so it's okay to use 10 sutures in spite of the fact that I've shown him, you know, 30 pictures like this, he still doesn't believe me. So don't use just 10 proline sutures if you're gonna be suturing in an IOL. Use at least 9 that is that is much bigger, or even Gore-Tex. But this is actually a proline haptic, and so these would break down also. Now, because of that, uh, you know, one company said, well, hey, let's do something that doesn't degrade at all. Let's make this loop out of titanium. This was, again, one of those companies that lasted for about a day because titanium is really heavy. And so you would put these things in there and they would just sink. I mean, they were really heavy. And, and, and now, I mean, there were no MRIs then, but can you imagine if you had a titanium looped IOL and you went to the MRI scanner? Oh, that would cause some real problems. And so the titanium lasted, again, about a millisecond before that was taken off the market. So this is what one of the, the worst lenses would look like. You can actually see the positioning holes, you know, there and there with that, the suture that broke. And so the suture broke there, and then here's the little tab trying to hold it in. You've got synechia, you've got inflammation, and so these really would beat up the iris. And then this is what one of the loops would look like on EM when it was removed. This is actually iris tissue adherent to it. And so the iris would get very adherent to it. Okay, so 
when people started doing extra caps, when they went from just removing the entire lens and its capsule to opening the lens, removing the contents, and leaving the capsule in there, kind of like we do now, people said, well, you should clip these in front of the capsule, but then somebody else was smart and said, why don't we actually change those loops so that those loops will go into the capsular bag? So they called it irritable capsular fixation. Now, you know, this was interesting because at this time, all these companies would come out. This is the Christmas ad. I love this for this company, Copeland. These are the little elves in the workshop making the Copeland IOLs. Copeland was interesting because Copeland is shaped like a propeller. And you would put it in there and two of those propeller blades would go behind the arrows and two would go in front. And so when you put these little Copeland lenses in there, you ended up with a square pupil. So two of those loops in front of the iris, two behind, it would clip to that. And so these were really wild. You'd see them in the clinic and they would be square. So square pupils, again, an iris fixated Copeland lens. And this is what could happen, again, with these corneal edema, UGG syndrome, synechia, glaucoma, all kinds of a fun thing. This is my favorite one, because this was these irritable capsular. Proven, safe and effective. Stamp, discontinued. So I love it. They, they like didn't even take it off the ad. They just stamped the discontinued on it. So eventually, I'll give it to Dr. Olson and then Dave Apple. They literally flew back to Washington and kind of testified at the FDA and said, you know, these really aren't very good lenses. You should pull these off the market. So they, they did eventually lead toward these unsafe lenses being pulled off being pulled off. So we're always in research, you're always on a teeter-totter between trying not to stifle research out on the edge, but on the same time trying to protect people from really you know, dangerous products. And so that's always that balancing beam that you're looking at. And so I mean, here we were really pushing hard to get these off the market, yet we were pushing hard for the FDA to approve IOLs. And so I have to tell you my second story. Uh, Dick Kratz is, is a really nice nice gentleman who was a real innovator in Southern California. He's the one who really would teach FACO to the masses for years. He and Bob Sinsky would, would teach these courses and I had the pleasure, I actually gave the Bing course talk two years ago, and sitting in the green room, you know, behind the stage when you're waiting to go on, he got the um, honored guest award. He was like 92, so I got to sit with him and chat for about 40 minutes, which was fun. So I was asking him to tell me stories about the old days and his best story is, Ralph Nader, you've heard of Ralph Nader, his group goes around and tries to take unsafe products on. They jumped on IOLs early on that, that these were unsafe. And so Nader was attacking these and so Congress was having hearings that they were going to ban all IOLs. And so at that time, Dick Kratz's, um, one of his most famous patients we put in IOL was a guy named Robert Young and that means nothing to you guys. but. In the days when there were only three TV networks and everybody watched TV at night, I mean, 50 million people would watch a single show. And the most popular show in America was Marcus Welby, MD. And he was this MD who had a private office who would take care of patients in the hospital. He'd go to their house. He would take care of maybe one patient a day because he would spend all day doing that. And he was the most trusted man in America, more trusted than Walter Cronkite. And so the actor who played him had an IOL put in and it resurrected his career and so Dick Kratz went and testified in front of Congress you know to refute these Nader's Raiders contentions nobody paid any attention and then Dr. Welby got up and testified again the most trusted man in America and he said this is a miracle this saved my career and so immediately the press jumped all over it and there was a huge press conference and so the Congress could really not shut down IOLs, nor could the FDA because of all this press. And so they did set up a study to, quote, study IOLs and their complications, but it allowed us to, to go on and keep using IOLs. So when I was a resident, you would have to be a, quote, study participant in order to put an IOL in. And so there were about 13 different companies making IOLs at that time in the U.S. And so the first day of residency, you filled out 13 IOL investigator forms, and then you'd be an investigator, and then you could put in the IOLs. So Dr. Welby, you know, kept IOLs from being shut down. Uh, would they test the IOLs in animals first? Yeah, they would. I mean, they would do the standard things they did, but again, you know, uh, rational science sometimes doesn't have anything to do with decisions that are made at a bureaucratic level, so. Well, the thing about some of the IOLs is they would look really good early, even in the early human studies. 
they would look good for the first two years. It would only be later that the complications would show up. So that's why I love this proven safe and effective discontinued. <laughs> so. so we make the swing from the original posterior chamber IOL of Ridley to anterior chamber IOLs, iris fixated IOLs. Slowly but surely in the late 70s and early 80s, as surgical techniques evolved, people started going from intracaps to extracaps. So when you do an extracap surgery, you remove the uh, hard lens nucleus, you'd suction out the cortex, but you'd still have an intact capsular bag. And so a smart surgeon named, named Shearing decided, well, you know, if we're gonna have that intact bag, why don't we go back to the posterior chamber, like, like Ridley said. So this was the original posterior chamber. I don't know. Interestingly, Shearing was a guy in Las Vegas who nobody knew who he was. He did this implant and never did anything else in his entire life, and so he, you know, but he was smart enough to figure this out. So ophthalmologists tend to be very innovative people. As Soon as somebody saw this, I mean, there was an explosion of innovation. I mean, we're talking within months, people were tinkering with this design. Now, if you look at this design, the problem is, is those loops come out fairly near the center and they come out straight like an umbrella handle with a little J on the end. So when you put these in the lens capsule, they would tend to really oval the capsule and not fit well. So a guy named Simcoe in, in uh, Oklahoma, again, a guy you've probably not really heard of that much, said, well, why don't we make these loops out of uh, a broad C-shape instead of a J-shape? So we made these broad C-shape loops. And this would be the idea is it would center better in the eye. And you can see with those broad C-shape loops it would, but these were very tough to put in. Again, we didn't have viscoelastics yet. So those little holes are positioning holes. You, you put an air bubble in there and you go in with the Sinsky hook and you know, pretend you're putting it in the bag. Who knows where it went? It'd go behind the iris somewhere. And so you'd put these in. And so uh, Bob Sinsky, who you guys use the Sinsky hook all the time now, who again just passed away. All these old giants in the last couple of years have just passed away. So Bob just died last year. And he came up with a modified J loop. So what he did is he took that loop and moved it off to the side where it came off, where it doesn't come off in the middle, and he put a little modified J in there. This was the IOL that I trained on. And so this was like the ultimate IOL in the mid-1980s. This was the modified J-loop, Sinsky, Sinsky lens. And so this was, again, proline loops, though. So three-piece IOL proline loops. Now, initially, there was an argument about where to put this IOL. And so the argument was, do you put it in the bag or put it in the sulcus? And there was some arguments, again, coming out of Johns Hopkins that said, you should put this in the sulcus because you can't be sure if you're gonna get it in the bag or not. So again, our lab had to write a major paper that said, no, no, there's advantages to putting it in the bag. And we actually wrote a paper on that. And fortunately, people said, yeah, you're right, we should put it in the bag. And so the idea of putting it in the sulcus you know, faded real quickly. And, and you know, nowadays we put them all inside the capsular bag where it should be. And so this is why you don't wanna put them in the sulcus all the time. This is an, an eye from behind. The okay, apple view has been sectioned. This area right here, you see that little C-shaped translumination there? That's where the haptic was rubbing against the posterior iris. And so you see that on the other side here, you kind of see part of the tip of the haptic there. And so if you put them in the sulcus, these lenses were not really designed to go in the sulcus. And so you would get significant problems, pigment dispersion, chronic glaucoma, chronic UGG syndrome. So really put it in the bag. And so this was an IOL that was in the sulcus. You can see again that loop went all the way back to the root of the iris. And then you can see up above, not only that, you've got a post peripheral anterior synechia. So that iris is stuck to the angle blocking it off. And lastly, you don't have an eye well in the back, you get a huge summering ring. A huge summering ring there. So this is where it should be. It should go into the capsular bag. And so this was a nice capsular bag fixated IOL, and you can <clears throat> see now those modified J loops, still they don't really fit that bag nicely. You still get some ovaling of the bag, and so people did tinker with them, and eventually we came up with a modified C, you know, kind of a short C loop, which again is what we use now. You know, it's a little short C shape rather than the J shape, but you can see once it's in the bag, that's pretty well tolerated, pretty well tolerated. And there you can see, this is a, 
picture, that's the posterior iris, that's the solar sulcus, solar body underneath. Iowa loop surrounded by the capsule, very quiet, very well tolerated. All right, so as the technology evolved, so did the way we make IOLs. And so initially, the IOL optic was carved you know, from a block of PMMA, it was hand polished, the three pieces of the haptics were staked in there. Well, people started coming up with a good technology where you could make them out of a one piece. And this was a, a lathe cut guided by a computer. I mean, this was as good as computers got in the 1980s. And so it would cut it, and then they would tumble polish it. And so I don't know if you guys as kids, or those of you who have kids, put the little rocks in there and you would tumble polish them and it would make the rocks all shiny. It's the same idea. You put a bunch of little beads in a big cylindrical drum with some material in them, it's got aluminum and other stuff, and you tumble these guys in there and it would polish them. And so you'd get these beautifully finished IOLs, these nice one-piece PMMA IOLs. All right, so we can't talk about IOL evolution without talking about evolution of surgical techniques because they go hand in hand. And so this is a case when I was a resident and my um, chief at that time still was doing extra caps. And so your job as a first year resident was to assist the chief and that's me holding the cornea up. So basically you would go in and you'd make this big 11 millimeter incision at the limbus you would pre-place sutures because the problem is is when you remove that whole lens, you know, they would get an expulsive sometimes and other things, so you want to have sutures in there to control it. And so my job, you'd leave a tiny flap of some, of some um, codger in there. So my job is to pull up the cornea and then you'd pull up the cornea and you'd go in there with a cryoprobe. And so you would first put in alpha chymotrypsin to dissolve the zonians. I can't imagine, talking about TAS syndrome, what that's gonna to do to the inside of the eye. You put alpha chymotrypsin in there, it would dissolve the zonians. Then you take this cryoprobe and you freeze it to the anterior lens capsule. And then you just, just pop that whole thing out of there. And so out it would come, intracap. And so you know, most of the time the vitreous face would stay intact. Most of the time, you wouldn't lose V most of the time, and then you put in an anterior chamber IOL. So that was an intracap. So people rapidly figured out that, you know, there are advantages to leaving the posterior capsule intact. You can put an implant in the posterior chamber. And so this was the way I was trained. You'd make a groove just back from the limbus, again, 11 millimeters, and you tunnel it forward just a little bit. You pre-place some sutures. You do a canopy capsulotomy. So you take a sharp cystitome and you'd make about 20 punctures, just like, you know, the punctures where stamps are stuck together. Make a bunch of punctures in there, take out the capsule, and then you would take a, a muscle hook and you push on the limbus inferiorly and then the lens uh, center would pop up, the nucleus, and then you'd slide a loop underneath it and take it out. And then you'd temporarily tie those sutures and you'd go in with a manual IA cannula. It was actually a Simcoe cannula. That's the other thing Simcoe invented. And you'd squirt fluid in with a bulb and you'd suck with a with a, a 10 cc syringe with your other hand and you'd strip out that cortex. And then you'd put in the IOL. Well, okay, so Kelman, again, same Kelman as the Kelman IOL. Again, he has a story he puts it. He's at his dentist's office and the hygienist is, you know, grinding plaque off his teeth with an ultrasound. And so Kelman looks at it and says, you know, what, you know, what is that that you're using? And they said, oh, it's a high frequency ultrasound. So he puts two and two together and says, hey, why can't we break up a cataract with ultrasound? And so he went to, you know, the company that was called Cavitron at that time, and they actually designed an ultrasound that would break up the cataract. Now, the first one that he did took like an hour of ultrasounding to get it off, but he persevered, he designed this, and he kept working on it, and eventually he came up with a usable ultrasound. So the idea is now you don't have to make that 11 millimeter incision, you can make a smaller incision and still go in there and use the ultrasound to grind up the nucleus. And so at the same time as he was inventing that, you know, people were looking at ways to do better capsulotomy, and this is one of those things where uh, for once, ophthalmologists didn't fight. About the same time, Howard Gimbel in Canada and Thomas uh, Neuhan in Germany came up with the idea of a capsulorexis. 
And so they gave each other credit. I'll give it to them. They're fine. But of course, in ophthalmology, there's always some obscure guy, someone who did it first. And so there's a video of this guy in North Dakota. I don't even remember his name who actually did the first Rexus before they did, but he never you know, published it or talked about it. Did he have an IA, like with the first ultrasound? Yeah, they did have an IA, and they'd come up with the automated IA with this too. Yeah. So when the capsule Rexus came out, we could now remove the IOL, I mean the um, uh, lens, uh, the lens uh, nucleus within the capsular bag without making a big incision. And so people came up, and that's where Dick Kratz and Sinsky came up. They came up with what's called the divide and conquer technique, where you'd make a groove, then you'd rotate it 90 degrees, make another groove, and then go in there with a second instrument and crack the, you know, crack the nucleus into four pieces and then take it out. And that's what you guys start to train on is, is divide and conquer. So that was the way you could do it through this, this closed um, capsular rexus. And the reason I'm showing all that is when we were doing all this, people said, hey, this is great. You could take out a cataract with three millimeter incision. Then you'd open the incision to six millimeters to put in the IOL. And it's like, well, that's stupid. Why are we doing that? So again, it bounced back to the IOL manufacturers who said, why can't we design a foldable IOL that'll go through a three millimeter incision and not have to open it up and so we started playing with different incisions we were making a this was a, a, a you know corneal scleral incision you'd go back a little bit you'd go down you tunnel forward the reason I'm showing you this is this is in essence the wound we make now for manual small incision extra caps except we curve it you know we do the frowning incision but it's the same idea you go through the sclera through the cornea and then eventually enter the eye so this was a incision that would seal real well and of course, eventually, we've evolved now to just the clear corneal incisions with these IOLs. So the first foldable IOL was a plate silicone lens. And Tom Mazzocco, who was one of Kratz's partners, came up with this idea. And so we used to call this the Mazzocco taco. Because you'd roll it up like a taco, put it in the eye, and unroll it. And this actually went in with an injector. It's a very clever idea. The problem is, is it's a plate lens, and it's silicone. But that was the first material we had. So this was truly the first foldable IOL. And so this allowed you to put an IOL in through an unopened incision. So you could put this in through a three millimeter incision and truly allow small incision FACO. Now you can see we were still doing a mini scleral tunnel. And we were actually still putting stitches in there. We didn't believe this would seal. And eventually, people figured out that, hey, this does actually seal up if you make it right. So this was the original Mazako taco. You could, you could polish it pretty well, but if you look, you get this little molding flash on here. Now, do you guys ever build model planes as a kid or model plastic stuff? It would have a molding flash on it. So I'm looking here, this is so sexist. The girls are going, who? Huh? The guys go, oh yeah, yeah, we built those. So, you know, you guys were still in the era where things were separated. Don't feel bad. When I was in junior high, the boys took shop and the girls took home ec. And we're talking, this is 19, you know, 69. This wasn't like back in the Stone Ages. And so it was like, and every once in a while, someone would say, well, can't girls take shop? No, 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 heavens no. So home ec shop. And so, same thing, model planes, mostly a guy thing. But you look at those model planes, they'd have this molding flash around them. And same thing with the silicone lenses. They would have this little molding flash around them. So they weren't that well finished. So as companies started to look at ways they could make it better, somebody said, well, why don't we just take the design that we've got now, you know, modified C-loop three-piece lens and make it out of silicone instead of PMMA. And so, indeed, the three-piece silicone lens. Now, silicone has some issues. It's got a relatively low refractive index. So you got to make them pretty thick. There were some in, there were some problems with you know compatibility of silicone. Like if you put silicone oil in an eye that had a retina surgery, it would stick to the silicone IOL. And so there were some issues with this. So, and this was the silicone lens that Star made. Does that look familiar? That's our sulcus lens of choice right now, or piggyback lens of choice right now, the Star silicone. All right, so people started looking at other materials because silicone wasn't good. One of the things they looked at is a hydrophilic, water-loving acrylic. And so this was Bosch and Loam's HydroView. This was a hydrophilic acrylic material. It was very biocompatible. They grafted some haptics on it. We did a bunch, this is a rabbit. We did a bunch of rabbit studies, very compatible, very good looking lens. Problem is you put it in and two years later, they would calcify. 
And so there were a whole bunch of reasons why these hydrophilic acrylic lenses that we're using in the US would calcify. But bottom line is, as these lenses calcified, Americans refused to use these. Now, hydrophilic lenses that don't calcify are available all over Europe, and, and they use them a lot, but not in the US because of the problem we had with this and with the memory lens calcifying. And for those guys in the lab, we still see memory lenses to this day coming out that have calcified. So the problem with the hydrophilic acrylics is if the surface changes somewhat, uh, it allows the calcium to come out from the aqueous and eventually calcify on the lenses. And so the hydrophilic acrylic material didn't work out in the US. And so the material that we've used most commonly now is hydrophobic acrylic, very low water content. These are what we think of as acrylic lenses. And this is the lens we use now. This was the original three-piece Alcon lens. This has a high refractive index. It could be made thinner. It's very strong. It's um, you know moderate biocompatibility, but it definitely doesn't calcify. And nowadays, of course, we've got the one-piece hydrophobic acrylic eye wells, and those are the ones we use now. And so, so that's. What's, so what do the Europeans do to make it so it doesn't calcify? Well, if it's well manufactured and you don't have uh, materials in there that shouldn't be there, some of the the reasons why the U.S. ones calcified is somewhere in the manufacturing process you'd get some stuff in there. It's, it's, complicated, but you get some stuff in there that would make it so the calcium would would um, you know would precipitate out on it. There were other ones that were poorly made where the calcium would actually be drawn into the polymer. You'd see calcification not only on the surface, but inside the polymer itself. People were saying some of it is the UV blocker that was bad, others it was the way they were sterilized. Um, There's all kinds of different reasons why it happened, but well made hydrophilic acrylics do not calcify. Even with the uh, like intracameral gas? Well, that's, that's a different thing. Now they're beginning to show up with intracameral gas or air. So if you're doing a desec and you've got a hydrophilic acrylic, those will actually calcify on the anterior surface outlining the capsule rexus. So those, that's just new though. That's just been in the last two years we've recognized that. So we've seen now, got probably, I don't know, 20 of those. I mean, we've seen quite a few of those. So I just, I stopped there because you know, I just wanted to give you the history, not, nothing modern. I'll give you the history, and Dr. Warner will talk to you a little bit about modern Iowa. So that's our crew in Barcelona, the tourists. You can see, of course, the shorts and the, the white tennis shoes. You can tell we're just so American. So because you look like an American doing that, I've, I've quit doing that. And so I actually bought some black tennis shoes and wear Levi's now, because then you don't look like an American. Because nobody wears, you know, in Europe, people wear Levi's with black dress shoes. I never figured that out. So I don't, I don't know why that is, but they do. So I hate that, because I wear tennis shoes when I'm walking around. So I bought black tennis shoes. So you can't tell, and I wear those with Levi's, and I stop wearing shorts, because you're just such an American when you do. So next time we're going to do, I believe, glaucoma. I'll have to look and see what the schedule is. I think it's glaucoma. Glaucoma. Okay, very good. So please read up on that because this is your, this was your um, day off, and so glaucoma. Know it well for next Tuesday. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.